Hi everyone, my name is Snaker Rajasekaran. I am a junior at Vesavia Hills High School in Birmingham, Alabama, and I will be your moderator for this evening. First off, thank you all so much for joining tonight's webinar. Before we get started, to keep things running smoothly, please take a moment to make sure that your audio is muted. And during the talk, please put any questions you have in the chat box. We will have time at the end to answer any questions for you to ask, and you can unmute yourself. Red Sari is a nonprofit organization with a mission to promote health among South Asian communities in the United States through outreach and education efforts designed to implement a comprehensive strategy on healthy diet, moderate exercise, good sleep habits, and mental health. Now, I'll turn it over to the Secretary of Red Sari, Alabama, Ms. Vino Denisivam, to introduce our speaker, Dr. Seima Mirza. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Vino Sivam, the Secretary of um, Red Sari, Alabama. Tonight, I wanted to, tonight's seminar, everybody knows about, you know, it's, it's, um, we are going to be focusing on efficient strategies to maintain a healthy heart, heart and lifestyle. To talk on this topic, I have immense pleasure of introducing Dr. Seima Mirza. Dr. Mirza earned her MD degree at the Aga Khan University Medical College in Karachi, Pakistan, before moving to the US. After her successful completions of um, US um, MLE and board certifications and cardiovascular specialty in 2004, she began working as a successful, and now she began working as a successful physician too. So now Dr. Mirza is the chair of the General Cardiology Center for Excellence in Birmingham, Alabama. She has been an active member in various organizations, including the American, Col American College of Cardiology, and the American Association of Cardiovascular and uh, Pulmonary Rehab. In addition, Dr. Mirza has several awards and honors, including the Bayer Scholarship, Zia al Haq Scholarships, and Merit Scholarships. We real Dr. Mirza for her tremendous support to the Red Sari of Alabama chapter as this is a great start for all of us to move forward with many, many activities in future. And I know we had a planned event supposed to happen um, sometime in July, with all these, um, and in April, and then we postponed it. And we're looking forward, it's a great kickstart, and uh, it's gonna be very informative, and uh, let's just uh, put our hands together, and uh, let's just welcome Dr. Mirza to give us an update. All right. Yep. Thank you. So, uh, can you guys uh, hear me okay? Yeah. So, uh, all right. Um, I'm going to be talking about strategies of the healthy heart. Some of you are physicians here. And so, this may be too basic of a talk for you. It is geared uh, more towards uh, lay people and really about educating uh, the community uh, about how to improve uh, their heart health. So we're going to start with epidemiology, the reason why uh, we worry about heart disease. So this is uh, just general about the United States. Uh, um, heart disease is a big problem for the United States. Um, at least 92 million US adults have at least one type of cardiovascular disease. And the numbers are uh, increasing by the year 2030. Uh, 43.9 percent of the U.S. adult population will have some form of cardiovascular disease, and worldwide, 80 percent of the cardiovascular uh, uh, deaths affect uh, people in low and middle income uh, countries. And a lot of people, unfortunately, die from undiagnosed uh, coronary disease. In the United States, every year we have 800,000 new heart attacks. And the majority of these people are above age uh, 65. So why should we care about it as a community? The reason is that we are a very high risk uh, population uh, for cardiovascular disease. Um, so the South Asians represent about 25% of the world population, but they account for 60% of the world's heart disease patients. And uh, the South Asians that are in the U.S. are more likely to die from heart disease than the other Americans. And unfortunately, there's not been a lot of uh, data in the United States on that, uh, because uh, anytime you do a study or anytime uh, you look at the ethnicity, they have always put us with other Asians. Uh, but genetically and ethnically, we're quite different from other Asians. 
so now there have been uh, more recent trials and studies and data that has shown that people of South Asian uh, descent, um, uh, such as uh, Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lankans, um, we are um, a separate entity and we have different risk factors. And our risk is much higher than other Asians and other Americans. So atherosclerosis, uh, as you all know, um, uh, your your heart needs oxygen to survive, and uh, your arteries, the coronary arteries, are responsible for getting the blood and oxygen uh, to the myocardium. The heart is muscle, and so uh, over time, as you age, uh, there's damage uh, to coronaries. There's fat deposit. And uh, over time, you get atherosclerosis, which is inflammation of your coronary, and you develop buildup of these substances in your heart. And if you plug your artery completely and you rupture a plug uh, that forms a blood clot over it, that completely uh, stops uh, blood flow to the myocardium, and that leads to, leads to a heart attack. So in order to prevent that, you have to understand what are the risk factors uh, for heart disease. So some of the risk factors, such as your age, gender, your genetics, your ethnicity, are things that are not uh, under your control. They're not modifiable. You're born with that or acquire that, um, and it's not, not changeable. But there are modifiable risk factors, uh, like your cholesterol, smoking, blood pressure, sugar, uh, your activity level, uh, your weight, and maybe to a certain degree, your stress. And with interventions like lifestyle changes and medications, you can modify some of these risk factors to decrease your risk of heart disease. And if you don't, the end result uh, could be a heart attack, which unfortunately in, in a lot of cases could be fatal. So the older you get, higher the risk of um, uh, heart disease. Every decade, there's a two to three-fold increase in risk of um, coronary disease. So gender, uh, there is some inequality in gender. Uh, when, when we are younger, men are at higher risk of heart disease than women. But after menopause, women quickly catch up to men. And even though it is more prevalent in men, it does not mean that it does not affect women. It still affects women, and it is still the number one killer in women. So uh, genetics, uh, we uh, touched on it a little bit. Of course, if you have family history of heart disease, you're more likely. Uh, uh, that's a big risk factor for you. So in African Americans, uh, it is more common than Caucasians. And of course, in Southeast Asians, it is more common than the rest of the ethnicities in the United States. And it affects us at a younger age. Um, and it is uh, because our arteries tend to be smaller uh, than others. And uh, when we do develop a blockage, it is much worse. And we usually have uh, multiple arteries that are involved and not just uh, one little uh, spot uh, like others have. So we have tendency to have worse heart disease. Um, and a lot of times um, when South Asians develop heart disease, they require open heart uh, surgeries and long-term outcomes are uh, uh, much worse in us. So unfortunately, my husband, um, uh, he had a cousin. His first heart attack was at age 30. And then uh, um, he passed away uh, at 40 from his uh, second heart attack. So, so it's a big problem. We have to think about it at a younger age. Um, so smoking is a, a single most important modifiable uh, risk factor for heart disease. And the number of smokers, despite of all awareness, continues to increase. And by the year 2030, uh, 1.6 billion people will have heart disease. And uh, smoking in itself contributes to 5 million deaths every year. And of course, uh, non-smokers can get secondhand smoke uh, from other people. And uh, cigar smoking, pipe smoking, of course, also increases uh, your risk. So uh, decreasing uh, smoking cessation uh, decreases the risk of heart attack by 65%. And even if you smoke less than 10 cigarettes a day, it is uh, worse than people that quit smoking. So at all quartiles, um, 
the, so the lesser you smoke, the better it is, but quitting is better than non -quit, not quitting. So cholesterol, um, uh, cholesterol is a type of fat. It is an essential substance that your body makes. And some of it uh, you get from uh, certain animal-derived foods. And it is an important contributor while calculating an individual's risk of having a heart attack uh, in the next uh, 10 years. And we use it a lot in cardiology to determine a patient's uh, uh, risk. And uh, it helps us modify the other risk factors as well. So um, diet and exercise um, are important contributor to this, and we'll talk about it in a second. And in certain cases, it runs in families. There are certain uh, familial uh, disor uh, disorders uh, that lead to high cholesterol. And unfortunately, it's silent. There are no symptoms. Um, uh, and the first symptom could be a heart attack or a stroke. So the cholesterol, or also um, uh, known as uh, your lipid uh, profile, basically it's carried in blood as a lipoprotein. Uh, so uh, water and um, and um, and grease, uh, as you as you know, uh, cannot mix. So for in order for cholesterol to be transported in your blood. Um, you uh, combine it with uh, proteins and uh, you form different lipoproteins. And the important ones are low density lipoprotein, also known as LDL, also known as bad cholesterol. And ideally, it should be less than 100 when you're fasting. And the HDL, or the high density lipoprotein, also known as good cholesterol, should be uh, greater than 40 in men and greater than 50 in women. So the reason we call LDL good, uh, sorry, LDL bad and HDL good is because LDL is manufactured in your liver and for it goes to your target organs and it gets uh, deposited in your arteries. Whereas HDL picks up the uh, cholesterol from your arteries and then goes to the liver and is excreted. And therefore it uh, sort of cleanses your system. Triglycerides are another type of fat. Um, uh, it is made of, of uh, uh, fatty acids, and uh, it should be less than 150 fasting. Triglycerides are very, very diet dependent. Uh, sometimes they can be inherited, but if you improve your diet, triglycerides certainly uh, uh, go down. And um, at very high levels, they can cause um, heart disease. Uh, but mild elevation of triglycerides we usually treat by uh, modifying the diet. So um, abnormal lipid levels can be genetic or it could be environmental based on our lifestyle, based on obesity, depending on what our calorie intake is, whether we are active or not, and whether our diet is rich in uh, saturated fats and um, sugars. So there's four groups of people that absolutely should be on statins, regardless of their cholesterol level. So it's important to know what your cholesterol is. However, if you belong to one of these, um, these four categories, uh, regardless of what your numbers are, you should still be on treatment for it. And the number one treatment uh, is statin. So anybody that has any kind of cardiovascular disease, whether it's peripheral vascular disease, coronary artery disease, history of stroke, um, any history of stents, heart attacks, so on and so forth, all these patients uh, need to be on a statin. All patients uh, whose LDL levels are above 190 should be on a cholesterol medicine. Uh, patients uh, that are diabetics should be on a statin, regardless of whether or not uh, they have evidence of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. And then um, we have a calculator. Uh, in practice, uh, we usually calculate 10-year risk for our patients, and if that risk comes out to be 7.5% uh, or higher, uh, we put all these patients on statins. And then beyond that, uh, there's a discussion between you and your physician, and you have to figure out who needs to be treated. But in the meantime, what you can do for yourself, uh, lifestyle-wise, uh, you should have a screening at least every five years if you check out normal. If your cholesterol comes back high, then you have to repeat it again in six months to a year. Try and maintain a healthy weight. Of course, you have to be physically active eat the healthy diet, and we're going to talk about it in a minute. And then uh, if lifestyle changes aren't successful, then you have to be treated with medications. And always, uh, of course, listen to your doctor.
High blood pressure, uh, hypertension is another risk factor, greater than 140 over 90, and 130 over um, um, 85 is high normal. Uh, so this is another silent cardiovascular uh, risk factor. And unless you screen, unless you check your blood pressure, you're not going to know if your blood pressure is high or not. Uh, so not everyone gets diagnosed, unfortunately, and even if patients get diagnosed, a lot of them are undertreated. So for every um, seven millimeter of mercury elevation in diastolic uh, blood pressures, there's 27% increase in coronary disease and 42% increased risk of stroke. So uh, every little bit counts. And uh, uh, bringing the blood pressure down is an important uh, way of reducing your risk for heart attacks and uh, strokes. So besides medications, uh, lifestyle-wise, uh, weight loss in itself brings the blood pressure down. Alcohol reduction helps. Exercise helps. Uh, salt restriction. Sodium. Uh, stress reduction and uh, smoking cessation. Those are all measures that we can do to help reduce our blood pressures if it's a problem. So diabetes um, is another uh, big risk factor. Um, we all know diabetes means high glucose levels and uh, why that is, that's a long uh, lecture in itself. So uh, three fourths of all deaths in diabetic patients are because of heart disease. And uh, diabetics have two to, four, uh, two to eight times increased risk of future cardiovascular events, more so in women. And uh, tight control of diabetes and aggressive uh, sugar treatment, uh, aggressive uh, glucose reduction, aggressive lowering of your hemoglobin A1C does decrease uh, your cardiovascular um, um, risk significantly. Now, unfortunately, diabetes is an important risk factor for uh, South Asians. It is one of the reasons why um, we have uh, uh, increased risk of heart disease because we have tendency for impaired glucose tolerance and at a much lower uh, BMI uh, than other ethnicities. And uh, the Masala study uh, showed that there's high prevalence of diabetes in South Asians compared to other ethnicity. and uh, uh, in pregnant women, um, pregnant South Asian women, uh, there's much higher risk of diabetes uh, than other um, uh, than women of other ethnicities. And um, we know that women that develop gestational diabetes, they are at higher risk of developing diabetes in future. And uh, and the BMI for for us is much lower. So you could be what is considered an ideal body weight and you could still have diabetes. Uh, because I think our frames are smaller, we're in general uh, supposed to be smaller, we're meant to be smaller. And um, if we weigh what, uh, what uh, Caucasians weigh and what African-American weigh or what Hispanics weigh, we develop glucose intolerance. So we need to be a much lower weight uh, than other, uh, our other American uh, friends. So, uh, so for, um, much lower uh, BMI and bo uh, body weight and waist circumference, uh, we develop glucose intolerance and uh, diabetes, which is a big risk factor for heart disease. So uh, for diabetics, uh, decrease the A1C as much as possible. Uh, exercise, again, diet. So you'll see the recurrent uh, theme in every risk factor reduction is exercise and diet. Avoidance of obesity and aggressive control of other risk factors. Is important in diabetes. So obesity is a risk factor for heart disease. And again, obesity for us uh, needs to be redefined. Uh, so obesity uh, is defined as BMI of uh, greater than 30. And I don't think, uh, I don't know if there's a consensus of uh, for South Asians what the exact BMI should be um, um, that is considered obesity for us. But because we have tendency to get fat around our organs, around our heart and, and liver, and that is associated more with heart disease. And so the lower weight you are, the less likely you are to have um, that, that fat around the viscera. And um, uh, that's a risk factor for uh, heart disease. We also have higher pericardial uh, fat, intermuscular fat, and this is associated with a higher risk of heart disease. Whereas people that have tendency to store their fat under their skin, um, that's a much less risk factor 
for heart disease. So, and then diet influences uh, your risk. Um, and um, it is felt uh, by the medical community that the integration of the typical South Asian diet with the Western diet has been a disaster. Uh, because we like to use traditionally uh, our diet. So, so if you uh, cook it the traditional way with a lot of uh, frying and ghee and butter and, um, um, and, and, and naan and so forth, um, a lot of carbs um, uh, leads to, uh, is, is not good for us. And that combined with uh, pasta and pizza and fried snacks and potatoes um, has not been um, good. And then, uh, uh, you know, sugar and sweets um uh that's uh, that's how we reward our our children and that's what we offer to our guests and um um it it is uh, bad for us also they found in the masala study that anytime people had ex experiences of discrimination or depression uh south asians uh went for uh, sweets both uh, both uh, mitai as well as uh, american sweets so the American Heart Association um, uh, recommends eating a balanced, uh, healthy diet, a wide variety of foods uh, from all the basic food groups. Uh, so they don't um, uh, go for a low carb diet and a high protein diet, or uh, they talk about, uh, still in this day and age, they talk about a balanced diet, and that's important. So the bulk of your diet uh, still should be carbs, but it should be healthy carbs. Uh, so a diet rich in vegetables and fruits, but in their natural form, and whole grain and high fiber foods. And minimize sugar, uh, whether it's in food or beverage, you have to do away with sugar as much as possible. So eat smart, um, eat tons of uh, vegetables, eat a lot of fruit, eat a lot of fiber, whole grains. So if you had to choose between um, a chapati and a naan, of course the chapati is much healthier than the naan because uh, the naan has a much higher glycemic index, uh, but the chapati should be whole wheat or whole grain um, um, and, uh, kind of bread. Uh, fish and lean meat without um, a lot of trans fat, fat free uh, uh, milk or low fat milk. And then uh, try and uh, avoid uh, partially hydrogenated uh, vegetable oils. So avoid trans fat and try and use monosaturated and polyunsaturated um, uh, fat. Um, so we talked about cutting back on sugar, cut back on sodium because that raises your blood pressure. And then alcohol, uh, what's considered uh, uh, acceptable is one drink a day per women and two drinks a day uh, per men. And anytime you eat out, you can be sure that it's going to be unhealthy. It's going to be full of calories, it's going to be full of grease, and it's going to be uh, full of um, uh, salt, maybe also uh, will have uh, a lot of sugar. Uh, they put a um, high fructose corn syrup on a lot of stuff uh, that we don't realize. So you always have to be careful when you eat out. A lot of uh, restaurants nowadays uh, put the calorie count on the menu. Uh, so be aware of that. A lot of them put carbs on there. Uh, so be aware of that and look at that when you're um, eating out. So uh, uh, cardiovascular risks of alcohol, it raises certain, uh, it raises triglycerides, uh, it raises blood pressure, it can cause congestive heart failure and cardiomyopathy, um, causes weight gain because there are calories in alcohol, and all, um, increases um, uh, your risk of developing diabetes because of the carbs in it. And then uh, increases risk of stroke in pregnant women, causes fetal alcohol syndrome, and then we talked about cardiomyopathy, um, uh, rhythm issues such as atrial fibrillation and certain cardiac death. So alcohol is not as benign as, as people um, think. Processed food um, is bad for you. So vegetables uh, are good and we do eat vegetables, but I think we fry them uh, a lot and we process them um, uh, too much. So uh, vegetables in their raw form is the best thing you can do uh, for yourself. So processed food is something uh, that needs to be avoided and try and find healthier alternatives um, uh, to that. And watch out for sodium uh, when you're um, going to the grocery store. So carbs, um, as we all know, there's, uh, there's uh, simple carbohydrates, which are sugar, refined sugars, uh, glucose, fructose, and galactose. Uh, so uh, that's what you try and avoid. But the complex carbohydrates 
um, which are present in um, uh, raw vegetables and fruits, uh, that's what we need. So focus on whole grain, um, uh, cereals and breads and rice, and uh, beans, lentils, and peas, uh, that's all good for you. So dietary supplements uh, for heart disease, the only dietary supplement on this slide that has uh, shown any benefit uh, for the heart is uh, fish oil. Uh, other than that, none of the vitamins, now vitamins are good for your overall health. You can take them for other reasons, but if you're taking them for the heart, you don't really need to. The only thing you need is fish oil. So um, physical activity, unfortunately, uh, we're not uh, very active as a community. Uh, in the United States, uh, uh, just because of physical inactivity, 25% of the US population does not participate in any, time of, uh, any type of leisure time physical activity. And there was a study on the South Asian uh, population in the UK, uh, which concluded that physical inactivity is an important contributor to the excess uh, cardiovascular mortality. That is of sort of community. Of course, the reasons uh, for physical activity is that back in the days, everything was um, agriculture based and people walked a lot and rode horses and so on and forth, so forth. But with mechanization, um, and driving cars and uh, desk jobs, um, people, uh, we have, we've moved to sedentary lifestyle and sedentary hobbies. Uh, kids just sit in their uh, rooms and uh, play video games, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, they're not outside playing. And uh, that is an important contributor uh, to heart disease. So more and more kids have been developing hypertension and high cholesterol and so on and so forth and um, that leads to their risk. So uh, the cardioprotective effects of exercise are that it reduces oxygen demand by the heart muscle, it improves your exercise capacity, reduces fat and diabetes, uh, lowers the blood pressure, improves the cholesterol lipid profile, and it, it decreases vascular inflammation, which is an important contributor to atherosclerosis. So, as uh, the level of fitness, uh, this graph just shows that as the level of fitness increases, there is decrease in cardiovascular mortality in various, uh, various studies. So uh, people that are active um, have a decrease in uh, cardiovascular events and cardiovascular death compared to those with sedentary lifestyle. So the American Heart Association uh, recommends um, 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, and that includes uh, brisk walking as well, uh, five, at least five days a week. And uh, resistance exercise, weight training, also contributes to cardiovascular benefit. So, and if uh, people that cannot exercise continuously for 30 minutes due to various limitations, if they do 10 minutes, three times a day, that would still count. So uh, anxiety and depression, uh, unfortunately, also predispose uh, to increase uh, risk of vascular disease. Uh, people that are depressed have three times increased risk of coronary disease. Um, people uh, that have a lot of anger issues and stress, and you know, we see this in, uh, of course, in Indian movies all the time, the son doesn't marry the girl the parents want to, and the next thing you know, the dad's having a heart attack. So it can happen, it's possible. Uh, you know, when there's increase in natural uh, disasters and earthquakes and so forth, there's increase in, um, uh, increase in um, uh, heart attacks and uh, so forth. Not all the time, not as commonly as you see in the movies, but it is possible. So uh, reducing stress is also important. Uh, you know, life is short, uh, be happy and don't worry so much about every little thing. So estrogen um, is, uh, is a tricky thing. So natural estrogen is protective of the heart. Uh, before menopause, uh, the reason women have less heart disease than men is because the estrogen, the natural estrogen protects them. However, after menopause, they catch up to men. So People said, well, why don't we just put women on hormone replacement therapy and uh, improve their cardiovascular risk? In, in observational studies, it appeared that it was working. 
However, unfortunately, when they did uh, large randomized controlled trials, they found that it actually increased uh, risk of heart attacks, strokes, and also breast cancer. And so um, cardiologists tend to be, and uh, I am also very anti-hormone, hormone replacement, uh, both oral contraception as well as uh, hormone replacement therapy. After uh, menopause, they are bad. It is not the same as natural, uh, natural estrogen that your body makes because um, the amount of estrogen that your body makes every day is very different, and it's not one single dose. So, and after those trials, I don't think anybody will do any more trials um, uh, to see. So, I don't think we would ever answer the question that if we tried a different type of estrogen or if we tried to use it in different amounts or tried to mimic how the natural estrogen peaks um, in a month, if that would work better. But as of right now, um, estrogens uh, are no no in people uh, yeah, uh, that are trying to reduce the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. So, so uh, to conclude, cardiovascular disease is a major killer um, everywhere, uh, but especially so for uh, the South Asian uh, community. Uh, so in order to uh, reduce your risk, um, eat right, exercise, uh, know what your blood pressure is. Ideal blood pressure is 120-80. Try and be as close to that as possible. Control your sugar um, and uh, avoid um, greasy foods. Uh, try to keep your lipid profile good. And if you're not a smoker, don't start smoking. If you smoke, quit smoking. And uh, that sounds simplistic, but it's uh, easier said than done. So if you guys have any questions, uh, you can feel free to ask them now. Yeah, of course. So I'll start. So, you know, due to COVID, there have been many heart attacks happening in the patients. So uh -huh. do you know if it's common for patients of all ages or if there's a specific correlation? Yeah, so, um, so with COVID, people that have pre-existing heart disease, uh, mm -hmm. they are higher risk of dying from COVID as well. And then COVID um, increases clotting. And so the heart attacks that you see secondary to COVID is due to clotting and that, that can um, happen across board. And what exactly uh, triggers it, uh, we're not sure. There's, uh, there's a lab test called D-dimer. And we check that and if the D-dimer is high, in general, those patients uh, have tendency for more blood clots and we now put them on blood thinners in order to avoid, and it's not just heart attacks, it's also strokes and it's also blood clots. Uh, they could be in other places in, in, in lungs, you know, in basically any organ. So. Right. Okay, so we have a question from Rajasekhar Namakul Surapan. And he asks, speaking about good and bad cholesterol, is it true that whether maintaining high levels of HDL is beneficial despite having above normal LDL content? So it depends on how high your LDL is. Uh, so yes, it is definitely beneficial and it is protective. However, people look at the ratio and a lot of people say, well, the, uh, the high HDL is neutralizing your LDL. Um, um, it doesn't say anywhere in the guidelines that we should not treat patients uh, that have high HDL levels. So if somebody has, say your LDL level is 160 and your South Asian ethnicity and you know you have other risk factors, then you probably ought to be on a statin even though your HDL may be 100. You know, so nowhere in the guidelines, no nowhere does the American Heart Association say that you should not treat. So. So yes, you're better off than people that don't have high HDL. The ratio does matter, but you still have to treat it. Yeah. So Dr. Mirza, can you please exit the screen? Uh, it's, 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 it's blank now so that- uh, Oh, oh. Uh, okay. I'll yeah, get just out. Just your screen does sharing. And How's yeah. that? Better? Yeah. Good. Yes. <laughs> All right, so our next question is from Vino Sivam, and she asks, should it be focused on lowering dietary cholesterol or saturated fat? Uh, say the, uh, can you repeat the question again? She asks, should it be focused on lowering dietary cholesterol or saturated fat? 
So basically, if, if your diet is full of saturated fat, uh, then your, uh, your cholesterol will probably be high. So it's basically both. Uh, so you want to lower your, 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 um, uh, your uh, cholesterol uh, by decreasing your saturated um, uh, fat. Now, some of it is genetic. So you may be eating perfect and your LDL may still be 200. And at that, that point, you should still eat healthy. It doesn't mean that you, you should stop eating healthy, but at that point, you have to take medication. Uh, there's no other way uh, around it. Uh, you know, and then some people like my mom, she always had the worst diet ever. I'll tell you that. And her LDL has always been under 100. Her LDL has always been 80 or 90. And, and that's just good genetics, uh, you know. So, so people are different in how they process. So a lot of, a lot of cholesterol your body makes. But some of it is origin. So we want to minimize uh, the cholesterol uh, that is coming uh, from, uh, from dietary origin. Uh, but yes, whatever we've inherited from our parents, unfortunately, uh, will still be there and we'll have to treat it uh, through right. other means. Okay, so our next one is from Rajesh Kumari, and she asks, what are the measures for salt uptake, especially when people taste and uptake a wide variety, even from one family? Salt. Yes. The question is about salt. Yeah. So salt. Uh, if you're hypertensive, then it's uh, four grams a day, and uh, it's uh, so basically uh, try and use as as little amount of salt as possible in your cooking. And then uh, when we are sitting at the table, don't put the salt shake. So don't let anyone add more salt uh, to um, uh, to their diet. Now. There are certain situations, uh, such as autonomic dysfunction and POTS and stuff, where I actually tell my patients to eat salt. That is very rare. But majority, for, uh, for most people, uh, we should not be eating, um, uh, eating salt. It's bad for heart failure. It's bad for, uh, for blood pressure and so forth. The recommendation is uh, four grams a day. Okay. Um, next, from Charles, they ask, what are the side effects of statin among South Asian community? So the side effects of statins among South Asian community would be uh, the same as any other community. Um, uh, the side effects um, uh, are a lot of people, the most common side effects uh, is that people complain of muscle aches. You have this generalized achiness. It involves more bigger muscles. So your upper arms and your upper legs uh, can in rare occasions lead to muscle weakness. Uh, there's also um, uh, um, a condition called um, rhabdomyolysis in which there is muscle breakdown. Now, that side effect is extremely rare. But uh, the most common side effect that people experience is muscle aches. But unfortunately, uh, you know, we're human beings and we get hurt and we have aches and pains. And people that are on statins, because they know there's that side effect, anytime people's little finger hurts or joint hurt or they have arthritis, they say, or back hurts, they think, oh, it must be the statin. And then they stop. Uh, but always uh, look at it and see if your symptoms don't improve after you discontinue the medicine for a week, then uh, you know that it is not from the medicine. And always discuss it with your physician. Sometimes you have to try a few different statins before you find one that works for you. So just like allergy medicine, like what allergy medicine works for me may not work for you, may not work for somebody else. And you have to try a few before you find one that's best for you. So for statins, uh, it's the same thing. Sometimes one statin, you may have achiness, muscle aches, um, but if you uh, do, then try switching to a different one and see if you can find one that works, especially if your LDL is, um, LDL is high. But the side effects, um, I've not seen any data that the side effects in uh, our population is different from other people. Those are the major uh, side effects. And also we, have, uh, we monitor the liver enzymes. Sometimes uh, statins can cause inflammation of the liver, which is reversible. If we see increase in liver enzymes, uh, we discontinue the statins and uh, the numbers of uh, the liver enzymes come down. Right, okay. So we have one from Uma Venkatesh from Facebook. She asks, should we be more worried about triglycerides or HDL or LDL? We should be uh, most worried about um, LDL. Uh, so high LDL is the worst thing. Uh, then low HDL. Um, is also bad uh, for you. 
However, in studies, when they tried to increase HDL levels uh, by taking medicine, that did not decrease the risk of heart disease. So artificially increasing uh, HDL levels by taking niacin or other medications did not decrease the risk of heart disease if patients were already uh, being um, uh, treated for their high LDLs and were already on uh, maximum tolerated dose of a statin. Triglycerides are important, but they're important above uh, 500. So they have to be really high before they start to affect your heart. Below that level, really the American Heart Association does not recommend even taking a phenophybrate. Now some doctors do treat it, uh, but there's no data. The most important for a patient is statins. It's a statin, statin, statin. And that is the only medicine that has been shown to uh, decrease uh, risk of heart disease. Besides some of the new drugs that you know I'm not going to get into. Uh, but yeah, the most important thing is um, high LDL. You need to uh, bring it down. Number two is a low HDL. Now, low HDL, if you improve it by improving your diet and uh, exercising more, that is helpful. But increasing it uh, with medications uh, is not. And then triglycerides, uh, bringing that down is helpful. Um, uh, it will also affect your pancreas uh, besides right. your heart. Uh, Garima Thakcham from Facebook asks, what does it mean when your good cholesterol is low? How would one increase it on a vegetarian South Asian diet? Oh, that's a, uh, that's a good question. I don't, uh, so a vegetarian diet, I mean, is a good diet. So you basically need more fiber. Uh, so a high fiber diet is a good diet. Uh, you can exercise. Um, uh, that's good for you. If you're uh, frying your vegetables, uh, stop frying them. Uh, so, but HDL um, um, uh, it can be increased uh, with taking a vitamin called niacin, but like I said, increasing it artificially by that way does not um, improve your risk. And people think that a low HDL is more of a bystander instead of uh, something that confers risk because um, even though we've seen that higher the HDL, less the risk of heart disease, but if you increase the HDL with medication, that did not somehow improve the risk. So uh, they think it's more of a, um, uh, uh, more of a, a predictor uh, than an actual, uh, it's not a causative um, uh, factor. It's more of a predictor. But you can, uh, but improving it with uh, exercise and, and diet uh, uh, would help, uh, taking niacin or other medications. Uh, would not help. So uh, things that are high in fiber, whole grain, uh, that would be useful. Getting back on fat, all the things that we talked about in cardiovascular exercise. Right. So. Uh, Vishwa Rajasthan asks, could comment on sugar foods. Are they all good or do we need to be cautious about them as well? Sugar-free food? Well, what was the question about? Uh, yes sugar-free foods, and she asked if they were all good or do we need to be cautious about them as well? So it depends on what you mean when you say sugar-free. So if you mean sugar-free and there's uh, some kind of sugar substitute in them, um, I'd, I'd caution. So, so you're not getting sugar, but uh, the problem uh, with those um, uh, foods is that artificial is artificial. And uh, some of these sugar substitutes uh, can cause uh, cancer. So that's not a cardiac related issue, but it does affect your overall uh, health. So I personally uh, think that um, instead of adding an artificial sweetener, you're better off um, not having anything. So if you feel like having um, uh, something sweet, you're better off uh, thinking of something that is sugar, but um, if you're not diabetic, you know, so if you're not diabetic, um, uh, you can eat a fruit, or you can have, um, a, uh, you know, a fruit yo uh, a yogurt and fruit, or, um, uh, or cottage uh, cheese and fruit. Um, and a fruit, uh, the sugar in fruit is healthier because it's not raw sugar, and so there's a lot of fiber in fruit, and so it's, it doesn't give you the spike, um, uh, the peak and trough that you get when you're eating um, uh, raw sugar, the purified sugar. So, so it absorbs kind of slowly and gives you steadier uh, sugar levels. And the, uh, the raw material of your body, the fuel of your body is, at the end of the day, it is glucose. So your body does need glucose, but uh, you need to 
get it uh, from um, uh, you need to uh, get it from healthy uh, sources. But sugar substitutes, I'm not a big uh, proponent of uh, because uh, sugar substitutes have their own um, issues. Not not for the heart, but for other. Uh, they can be other health issues uh, because of that. So I don't. And and some people believe that. Uh, 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 that agave is okay, and, and some people think Splenda is okay, but uh, they keep changing their consensus on what's good and what's not. So I think it's best to just avoid um, uh, raw sugar as much as possible. Oh, you're muted now, Sheikh. Hear me now? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. So we have one from Piba Shanmugan, and she asks, are there any medications to prevent heart attacks from reoccurring? Uh, so yeah, there's uh, uh, there's medicine. So uh, some, when somebody's ha had a heart attack, uh, you're on aspirin lifelong. Uh, that's a medicine, uh, beta blocker, uh, like a tenolol, metoprolol, Coreg. Uh, we put patients on that. And then uh, we put patients on, on statins. All patients that have had heart attacks, like I mentioned, they all need to be on a statin. Statins uh, decrease uh, uh, risk of heart attacks. And uh, uh, the last thing is ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, depending on what their heart pumping function or ejection fraction is. Uh, sometimes we put patients on that and um, that improves outcomes as well. Uh, but those are the drugs uh, that we use. And then there are some others depending on um, every patient's individual um, uh, situation. Okay, so we have one from Gobinath Shanmugam, and he asks if there are any specific statin, such as a torvastatin or simvastatin, that work better in South Asian communities compared to other communities. Um, so I'm not aware of the data on that. Uh, I'm not sure which one works better in South Asians compared to others, but in general, uh, resuvastatin, which uh, used to be marketed under the trade name Crestor, is the best statin that is out there. And in general, it lowers your cholesterol better than any of the other statins. Uh, number two is a torvastatin, and then number three is um, a simvastatin and Livolo. Uh, I am personally not a big fan of simvastatin. The reason is it reacts with a lot of other medicines, um, and some of these medicines we use for treatment of hypertension and other heart uh, issues like rhythm problems. And uh, and there uh, have been um, uh, some reports of uh, more muscle side effects at the higher doses of simvastatin. So I personally try and avoid simvastatin in patients unless they have, um, uh, they're not tolerant of statins and that's the only one that works for them. But the best statin out there is uh, resuvastatin and the second best is atorvastatin. But, uh, but I would assume that it'll be the same, um, uh, same benefit across um, all ethnicities. Right. So we've got one from Annabelle Jayanth, and she asks, once started on statin, does it become mandatory to be continued through our life, or can dietary and lifestyle modifications reduce our dependence on statins? So you don't have dependence on statins. It's not habit-forming, and it depends on the reason. Like if you're on a statin because um, you were eating unhealthy and not exercising and so forth, and you improved your diet, uh, you could maybe come off a uh, statin. However, if you're on a statin because uh, you've had a heart attack, uh, you should probably be on a statin lifelong because it does reduce your future risk of heart attacks. So it depends on why you're on the statin. Sometimes uh, it's very rare occasions that uh, we can take somebody off the statin, but the reason we continue it is not because the patient has become dependent on the statin or developed uh, tolerance to it, uh, but it's because uh, the benefit uh, continues uh, lifelong, so unless there's a reason to stop it, such as a side effect, um, we usually don't stop it in majority of the patients. Okay, so we've got one from Kishore Narasimhan, and he asks if there are any studies that address the benefit of hormonal estrogen therapy in postmenopausal women suffering from CBD. If so, what are the outcomes? Yeah, so there, uh, um, I did mention the studies when I was uh, giving my presentation, and there's uh, multiple, multiple studies. And uh, uh, the randomized controlled trial shows that uh, hormone replacement therapy uh, increases risk of cardiovascular disease. It does not decrease risk of cardiovascular disease. It helps 
the symptoms of menopause, it helps uh, with hot flashes, but it increases risk of blood clots, blood clots in the lungs, blood clots in the legs, uh, blood clots in the heart and the brain. So um, hormones equal badness. Right. So we've got one from Rajarajan Amir Talingam, and he asks if there is any chance of the SARS COVID to use the HDL and LDL receptors for cellular entry in addition to ACE2. Uh, not that I'm aware of. I think it uses the ACE2 uh, receptor for entry, so I don't think it uses HDL or LDL that I'm aware of. Okay. And then we've got one from Sunita Narayanan from Facebook, and she asks, short-term palpitations or heart pounding, can it ha happen when one's a normal blood pe pressure and HDL slash LDL? So the question is, uh, can you have palpitations with normal blood pressure and normal HDL and LDL? Yeah, so palpitations have nothing to do with your blood pressure and uh, they have nothing to do with your LDL and HDL level. Um, palpitations uh, are not necessarily associated uh, with uh, coronary disease. That's a different type of heart issue. It's an electrical issue. So, so your heart um, uh, has an electrical system that is separate from the coronaries. And uh, uh, the palpitations, uh, what we call palpitations, it could be rapid heart beating, it could be uh, skipped heartbeats, it depends on what a person is calling palpitations. And uh, you can have palpitations with a normal blood pressure and normal cholesterol. Uh, but of course, if you're somebody that has palpitations, you need to go see your doctor and discuss it with them and see why you're having them. Right. There, are, there are a lot of different things that can cause them. Mm -hmm. So we have one from Ram, and he asks, is the new drug in Next Little any better than the statins? Which, um, uh, which drug are we talking about? Next Little. Bepidoic acid. No, no so uh, uh, the, best, uh, the best drug right now, which is cost effective, is um, statin. And the best data is with statins. And the second best is um, PCSK9 inhibitors, which are um, which is Rupetha and uh, Praluent. And but those are very expensive. They cost about forty thousand dollars a year. So insurance doesn't want to pay for it right now. Um, and then uh, number three is uh, Zedia. There are a bunch of other drugs. Uh, there is uh, data that they improve, but we don't have enough um, data with um, uh, severus reduction. So I think serious reduction um, is best documented with statins. They've been around the longest. Uh, we've, uh, we know how to use them. We know how to treat with them. Um, I think old is gold. Uh, I always believe in uh, treating patients with old drugs. I don't believe in using the new drugs uh, a lot because of some of the side effects you don't know until later. So it's, it's better to stick to something um, that is true and proven and um, uh, and and they work, you know. So now, if somebody's uh, statin intolerant, uh, then my next uh, uh, next choice is uh, uh, Repetha and Pravlin or Zedia. Right. So our next question is from Red. They ask if there are any links between belly fat and heart attacks. If so, what yes. are the differences between men and women? So yes, there is uh, there, there is a link. If you uh, gain, uh, gain fat um, uh, right here, uh, you probably have more visceral fat, and that is linked with higher risk of heart disease. And uh, what was the other question? Uh, difference between men and women? So it depends. Some men have more belly fat uh, than others, and some women have more belly fat than others. Um, I don't think uh, there's necessarily always a, a gender difference. Uh, both, uh, both genders would be higher risk um, uh, for heart disease if you have more uh, belly fat. So, so there's a difference. If you're pear shaped, you know, so there's the pear shaped and the apple. Uh, so people that carry it more at the bottom, we call them pear shaped, and they're more more likely to have heart disease. And then uh, the apple shaped people that are more symmetric, uh, 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 they're big, but they're it's more symmetric. It's spread out. Uh, they are actually at uh, uh, they are also at risk for heart disease, but not as much as people that carry it all um, in their um, abdominal area. Okay, right. Uh, so our next question is from is from Sarada Devi, and she asks about the dietary B vitamins, especially B six and B twelve, 
and folate implications in the susceptibility of checking? So the B vitamins um, are good for your overall health, but uh, in general, uh, they used to prescribe B vitamins like 20 years ago to protect the heart. And they used to put uh, everybody on folate B6 and B12, uh, but not in this day and age. Um, they, there have been uh, multiple studies that proved that um, they were not helpful in reducing our risk of heart disease. So if you're eating a balanced diet, you're probably getting your B vitamins. If you wanna take an extra multivitamin, you can. But taking extra uh, uh, B vitamins and B complex and B6 and folate is not necessary unless you have a known deficiency of one of the vitamins. Right. So we've got another question from Vino Sivum, and she asks if you are on statin, do you need to be worried about a high fat diet? You should still, yes. It does not mean, it does not give you a get out of jail free card. It does not mean that you can go and eat whatever you want to. So, so you still have to uh, watch your diet, uh, 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 still eat healthy, and um, uh, because diet affects other things besides um, uh, your cholesterol. And so uh, some people think, let's just take a statin and then let's go eat pizza. Uh, you shouldn't do that. Uh, you should still eat healthy. And also if you ate healthy, you probably would be on a lower dose of statin. You know, so in, in all medicines, uh, there's no medicine without side effects. In all medicines, the side effects are higher at a higher dose. Right. So yes, even if you're on a statin, you should still watch your diet. So another question from Red Sari, and they ask, what are the pros and cons of the paleo diet and skipping breakfast? Okay, uh, I don't know because uh, uh, I'm not a dietitian or nutritionist and that is not my area. And I've never followed the paleo diet, so, okay. so I don't know the answer. Okay, but do but you, you know, the, for the heart in general, we recommend uh, we don't recommend fat diets. Uh, I tell people uh, stick to a balanced diet from each food group. So you're supposed to eat a little bit from each food group, and at the end of the day, bulk of your diet. So so uh, so the American uh, Diabetic Association and American Heart Association they all recommend eating. The bulk of your diet is still carbs, but it has to be healthy carbs. Right. So we've got a question from Rajasekhar Namakosurupan, and he asks, how much of exercise every day or every week is cardiac friendly as athletes performing endurance exercise experience cardiac remodeling? Yeah, they experience cardiac remodeling, but it's it's in the good direction, you know. So it's not uh, it's it's not bad, and their heart rates are slower, but that's uh, that's a good thing. And uh, so uh, the American Heart Association says minimum of 150 hours a week, or um, I think that's uh, 30 minutes five uh, five days a week. Uh, so uh, and that's minimum. If you want to do more, uh, they don't say that uh, it's bad for you, you know. Um, so it's actually a good thing. Now, if you have certain heart conditions, then you should not be an athlete and you can't uh, do too much, such as a hypertrophic of, of cardiomyopathy and so forth. So if you have a, a condition, then, um, then, then you shouldn't. But assuming um, uh, that uh, uh, you have um, coronary disease or you don't have any, anything and you're just doing it for preventive uh, purposes, uh, then there's no, uh, no limit from, uh, from our end that you should not um, 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 overdo it. Um, but I mean, it's, it's not, uh, you know, unless, unless you're a competitive athlete, uh, I don't know if somebody's motivated to go and exercise all day long. I mean, nobody can do it. We all have lives to live. So there's other things we need to do with ourselves besides just exercise. Right. So we have another question from Charles and he asks, is plaque built up a better measure than cholesterol count? Uh, so I don't know if he's asking about calcium score. So there's something called calcium score, which uh, shows uh, the amount of atherosclerosis or, or uh, calcified plaque in your coronary. So it's a CT scan uh, that you do, and uh, you come up with a number, and higher the calcium score, um, higher your risk of heart disease. Um, uh, however, uh, we're not looking at the soft plaque uh, that way. Um, I think uh, those are all different things. I you have to look really, you can't say this, uh, this one is a better predictor than that. Uh, you look at the whole picture. You don't look at one or the other. 
so you look at the whole picture uh, of a person, uh, of an individual, you look at all their numbers, and uh, you take it in context of the whole situation. So if say your, your cholesterol is borderline, uh, your cholesterol is say, uh, for example, 130, which under normal circumstances, you'll say, well, just 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 diet and exercise, but say your calcium score comes out to 1,000, then in that situation, that means you need aggressive treatment, you need, uh, uh, you need to be on a statin, you need to be on an aspirin, and you need to lower your blood pressure down to 120, 80. So you have to look at the whole thing. You don't look at one number. And you look at the person. We don't treat numbers. We treat people. Right. Okay. Um, it has come to a close. So I just want to say sure. all of our questions tonight. And thank you so much for sharing your expertise with Red Sari and the organization on strategies for a healthy heart that we can all take away to lead a healthy lifestyle. Thank you to everyone on the Red Sari team and all of our audience members for joining today. And have a great night. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you for moderating. I had a great time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marza. That was a wonderful talk. And then we will do more, actually. It looks like you have a lot of information. Bye, <laughs> my good talk. Good talk. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Bye -bye.